and their conviction and passion resulted in sufferings for themselves and their families. Of these 56 men, five were captured by the British and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army, and another two had sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds of hardship of war. These are not the facts that we think about when we're busy planning our barbecues and picnics or kicking back to enjoy the time off. But these are the facts of what happened to the people who sacrificed to win us our freedom. We're young as a nation compared to the rest of the world, and, and yet we stand tall among the nations because of the strong and important principles upon which we were established. Hear these familiar words from the Declaration of Independence. Join me in saying them if you know them. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those who work for justice in our world remind us day by day the commitment that our ancestors have made, the freedoms that they sought, and the reasons that they gave their lives. All are equal? Well, we're still working on that within the church, aren't we? Life, liberty, and happiness? These are the rights given to us by God, rights nobody can deny us, rights that should not be taken away from us. And isn't that what we seek today as people of a free nation and as disciples of Jesus Christ? We're still pursuing life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, aren't we? This is part of the gospel that we share with the world. Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus walked this very same earth, speaking of life, freedom from our sins, and the happiness that is ours through relationship with God. In our gospel lesson today, as the disciples, the disciples were given a task to go out two by two and offer a message that the kingdom of God had come near. It was an exciting message, a message that offered freedom they were to be evangelists. Evangelism is communicating a message. Are we as believers called to be evangelists? Yes, yes we are. Are we to witness to the work of God in our own lives? Yes. And are we as Methodists called to be evangelists? Yes, yes we are. All followers of Jesus have been given the great commission to go and tell. All followers of Jesus are expected to participate in that mission. We share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the in immediate intent of conveying to the hearer the story of love found in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And through telling the story, we offer the opportunity for a person to come to the place where they might accept for themselves the love of God offered through Jesus. It's done through sharing. It's done through conversation. And it's also done when we live our life out in faith, enabling others to see that living in the love of Jesus makes a difference here and now. How should evangelism be defined? Well, in this New Testament story that we just read, the answer is found in simplicity. Evangelism is sharing the message. Evangelism is also giving the listener the opportunity to respond. Not to respond to us, but to respond to God, to respond to the message. It's then that we understand that evangelism is not just telling the story of salvation, but also inviting the person into the story of salvation. This is the opportunity Jesus gave the disciples when he sent them out two by two. Jesus' mission for the disciples was clearly defined for them. They were sent on heads of 
prepare the way. There was urgency. But they were to stay focused. Jesus said not to bring anything with you. Don't be bogged down with luggage. Accept the hospitality of others. Eat what is offered to you. And fully rely on God. Don't waste time. But be about the business of spreading the message. Well, upon their return from their two-by-two -two missionary trip, the disciples were excited, and they were surprised by what happened. Jesus turned to the disciples to address them about their awareness of what they had seen and had experienced. They were amazed by the power found in Jesus' name to cast out demons. Seems that the disciples were surprised that the demons would submit to them. Well, they didn't realize the power found even in the name of Jesus. They would realize this and much more toward their, towards the rest of their time together. Jesus redirects their excitement to the mission. They should rejoice because their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The greatest wonder of all is the reality of salvation. The kingdom of God is near. If we continue to read on in this chapter, Luke, we're told Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and then thanked God through prayer that the message was received. Not by the wise and the intelligent, but by the masses of people, the everyday people. The people willing to open their homes and listen to the disciples. We might say, the simple people. Jesus called them infants, not because they were babies by birth, but babies by spirit. Those who were able to think and understand with simplicity, whose hearts were newly opened to accept the message. Jesus came to set people free. In Galatians 5.1, the words of Paul tell us, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Paul reminds the people that they have been set free, set free through Christ. And he tells us that we're made free by believing in the way of Jesus, in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. He encouraged the early believers not to fall back into the yoke of slavery. Now, the slavery he speaks of is the slavery of living in sin. Be strong in Christ and don't return to a life of sin. Paul urged them not to be bound to the old way, the way that bogs them down spiritually, but to embrace the joy of the freedom of forgiveness and reconciliation. Paul was an evangelist. He couldn't help but tell everyone about Jesus. Does your relationship with Jesus set you free? Are you free to live and to love in all of your relationships? Does your excitement over your spiritual freedom come to you as you tell people about your faith in Jesus? But what does this freedom talk mean to us today? We who are living so many years later from the time when Jesus sent the disciples out two by two to share the gospel. Due to the nature of the human condition, we're still sinners in need of salvation. Right? People are still spiritually seeking the freedom that Jesus has to offer. Sin is still sin. People are still people. And we have the same human condition as that that's described in the Bible. For us to be free then today and live as disciples of Jesus Christ, we must heed Paul's words to stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. In John's Gospel, chapter 8, Jesus explains how we're free. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. We've heard that, right? Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household, but the son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus' mission was to tell us about the Father and to ultimately remove the barrier of sin that keeps us from
from the freedom of a relationship with God, to tell and teach us how to live so that we would be one with the Father and one with the Son, to enable us to have a permanent place in the household because of our relationship with the Son. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. In Jesus, there is life. We can still be slaves while living in a free country. With all the freedoms we have available to us, many are still bound and, and don't feel like they are free. Financial burdens can make us feel like we're living as slaves. Society obligations can make us feel like we are overwhelmed and we are slaves. Inequality in the way we are being accepted or in the way we are being treated can enslave us. Our jobs can surely make us feel like slaves and added responsibilities and stresses, things that stress us out and pull our priorities out of place can enslave us. Basically, anything that separates us from the freedom that Christ offers us keeps us from truly being free. It's the job of the government to keep us free as a nation. And those that fight for our freedom work hard and they train hard to see that we are free. And it is our job as Christians to see that we are truly free under God by devoting ourselves to sharing the story that keeps us free in Christ. Truth is found when we seek the freedom we have in Christ. We each have a different way of interacting with God what we call our spirituality, through learning about ourselves and the ways in which we interact with God, we can identify which acts of spiritual piety will help us improve our relationship with Jesus. We will learn how best to serve others and to worship God through community as we embrace the elements of our faith, through liturgy, through song, through prayers and through praise, and by seeing to the truth of God and God's love. We will gain a better understanding on how to improve our relationship with God and with one another, both individually and collectively as a church. As we gathered at the communion table this morning, we united ourselves with Jesus in love. And as we confess our sins and seek forgiveness to live in peace with one another, we reveal a desire to be part of the truth for others. And when we interact with those in community, we represent truth and offer truth, and we offer peace through Christ. It's the government's job to keep us free as a nation, and it's the church's job to see to the freedom of the souls of the people, all people, everywhere. God's prophet Micah gave us an example of what we are to do. In Micah 6, 8, we are told that we are to, what does the Lord require of us but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God? Is that the freedom that you live under? Is that what you strive to do each day in your faith? Have you found the freedom in Christ alone? that provides you with justice and kindness and heeds your daily walk with God. This is hard stuff. Freedom is serious business, and it takes passion, and it takes planning, and it takes perseverance. The results, however, are worth it, for it means living in joy and peace. As we prepare to end our celebrations and go back to our normal work week, we pray that God will direct and guide all of us towards a world that lives in freedom and in peace. And let us appreciate the sacrifices of others and declare the gospel of Jesus Christ to all. Thanks be to God.